My name is Jared. I'm one of the pastors here, uh, Grace Warman, along with Mark and Clay. Uh, I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, I'm looking forward to continuing on in our series uh, that we've been going through for the, the past several months uh, in the book of Luke. Uh, so for those who gather with us regularly, uh, you'll know that my family and I will soon be leaving Grace Warman uh, to plant a church along with the Bittners in Edmonton, uh, as Mark mentioned earlier. And so in just over a week from today, we're going to be packing up and heading west. Um, so we're going to be coming back for the 23rd, but uh, in nine days from, from today, our family is actually going to be moving out to Edmonton. And so uh, for those uh, maybe who are just visiting here or haven't heard the story, I'll, I'll give you a, maybe a brief backstory uh, about what's going on. So in 2022, through a lot of prayer and what we believe was the Spirit's leading, uh, the, the decision was made that our family, along with the Bittners, would be sent out from Grace Warman to plant a new church in the city of, Edmund, uh, city of Edmonton. And, and so in Matthew 28, we see Jesus tell his disciples that they are to go and make disciples of all nations. We believe that through what we see in the Bible, that this call to make disciples is best lived out in the local church. And so we want to be a church that plants churches, full of disciples who make disciples. And we want this because we want more people to see the good news of the gospel. We want more people to see the beauty of Jesus. And so we set out on this journey to plant a new church. And so for the last year and a half, uh, we've lived knowing that a day was coming that we would no longer live here in Warman. And so that means we've lived differently. Uh, we, we took several trips to Edmonton. Uh, we scouted things out. We put our house up for sale, eventually uh, sold it and bought a place in Edmonton. Uh, when our furniture wore out, we decided not to replace it. That way it would just be easier to move, less stuff. And we actually started selling a lot of furniture and other things we didn't think were worth bringing with us. Now, we researched things to get involved in when we went to Edmonton. Uh, we started handing off some of our responsibilities here in Grace Warman to others. Now, we're doing all these things to prepare for the day when we're going to move. So what if we hadn't done any of that stuff? Now, what if I told you that we hadn't done anything to get ready to move yet? We're moving in nine days. We haven't started packing. We haven't booked a moving truck. We haven't put our house up for sale. We haven't bought a place in Edmonton. Now, if I told you that, you would probably think that I was crazy, and rightfully so. Or you might more likely think that we're not actually moving. Because if we were, we would be getting ready. If we knew that day was coming, we would be living like it. Now, the Bible tells us that there is a day coming that will change everything. It's a day that if you love Jesus, you should be eagerly looking forward to. Because it's the day when Jesus will return. And yet, even though we know it's coming, how often do we live like it's coming? Do you live in light of that day? And so, as I said, we're continuing on in our series through the book of Luke. So, uh, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 12. If you have a paper copy of the Bible, you'll find Luke roughly three quarters of the way through. Um, so, this morning we're going to cover verses 35 to 48 of Luke 12. So, while you turn there, I'm just going to pray. Uh, and then we're going to listen and, and read along as this scripture is going to be read out on the screen behind me. So, Father, I just want to thank you again for your word that we get to go through Thank you for your re revealing yourself um, through this. And I just ask this morning that as we go through this passage, that you would once again open our eyes and ears so that we could see you. So that uh, I just pray that you would, you would speak to our hearts this morning. Uh, allow us to see you more clearly and to love you more deeply. We pray this in your name. Amen. Reading from Luke chapter 11, verses 35 to 48. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. 
you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household, to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know, and did what deserved a beating, will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Right, so uh, just by uh, some brief context, throughout chapter 12 here, Jesus has been teaching a large crowd as well as his disciples. Now, a couple weeks ago, Clay brought us through uh, Jesus' parable of this rich fool. Now, this man, he was really successful. He had a lot of wealth. And he thought he was all set. He could just put his feet up. He could eat and drink and relax. But God calls him a fool because he was not rich towards God. So rather than being generous, he just hoarded all his wealth for himself. And in the parable, God essentially tells this man, what good is your wealth when you die? It's not going with you. The fact that he was wealthy wasn't the problem, but his wealth became his priority. It became the focus of his life. And then last week, Mark brought us through Jesus' teaching on anxiety, and we saw how these misplaced priorities... A focus on the wrong thing, it leads to anxiety. And Jesus shows us a better way to live, and that's to seek his kingdom first. And so throughout this chapter, we see Jesus teaching us not to be disproportionately concerned with the things of this world, whether it's our money or our safety or our health or our comfort. Not that any of these things are wrong in and of themselves, but they become wrong when We entrust them to ourselves, and we give them priority over God. And so in today's passage, Jesus contrasts this way of living with the way we should live. Starting in verse 35, he says, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. So Jesus says, stay dressed for action. Now, this phrase maybe loses uh, some meaning for us because of cultural differences between the people that Jesus was originally talking to and, and us today. So back then, both men and women, they would have typically dressed in these long robes or tunics. They would have gone down to their ankles, and they would have been tied around the waist with a belt. So I'm sure you can imagine this type of outfit would make certain tasks a little more challenging. But since clothing was very expensive back then, they couldn't just have a different outfit for every different thing they were going to do. Now, they couldn't just throw in a pair of blue jeans when they were going to work or some Nike shorts when they were going to go run. Instead, they would use their belt to tie up their tunic in a way where it would would come to around their knees. And that way, they could move more freely, and that's what they would do when they were going to go work, or if they were going to go into battle, or if they needed to run somewhere. And so to stay dressed for action today would be something like, keep your running shoes on. You know, change out of your pajamas and your slippers. The picture that Jesus is giving here is one of being ready. The, the picture of the lamp is the same. Keep the lamp burning so that you're ready. Be so ready that you don't even need to take the time to get dressed or light your lamp. So then the question, of course, is what are we supposed to be ready for? Now Jesus, he goes on to explain in, in three short parables here, starting in verse 36. It says, And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. So Jesus explains, they should be like servants 
waiting for the master to come home from a wedding feast. Now, these servants, they need to stay ready because they didn't know exactly when their master was going to return. So wedding feasts in the time, they didn't really have a set end time. The master couldn't exactly text his servants on the way home and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be home in 15 minutes, open the door. They had to stay ready to open the door when he returned. Now, so far, this parable, I mean, that seems pretty straightforward, right? That's the servant's, the servant's job is to serve. And so it, it, it's, it's normal, it seems normal. But then it takes an unexpected twist in verse 37. Jesus continues, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. And if he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. So do you see the, the twist there? When the master returns, who gets served? It's the servants. The servants get served by the master. That, that's not how this is supposed to work. When the master gets home, they should be, the servants should be ready to serve the master. That's not the case here. It's those servants who are staying awake waiting for him, even if it's late in the night, that are blessed. Jesus, his point again here is to stay ready because there's a really great day coming. He says to stay awake even in the second watch, in the third watch. And so the second watch, the way the Jewish people would have counted it, would have been between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. And then the third watch from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Now, I don't know about you, but these are times when typically most of us want to be sleeping. But Jesus says, is saying that the master could return at an unexpected time, so stay alert. Well, he continues on with another short parable in verse 39. He says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not left, have left his house to be broken into. So he tells another short parable here. He continues his point that the, the awaited return is going to come at an unexpected time, just like a thief. Thieves don't make appointments. I have never heard of a thief calling ahead, saying, hey, like, I'd like to rob your house between 2 and 3 a.m. if you could just schedule me in. That's, that's not how it works. The point of the parable is the same. You're not going to know the time he will return. And now this flies in the face of all the, the people over the years who have tried to predict when Jesus will return down to the hour. You, you just can't do it. You don't know. No one knows, so be ready at all times. But just in case these two parables haven't been clear enough, Jesus makes sure the disciples know what he's talking about in verse 40. He says, You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is what Jesus says that we're to be ready for. The Son of Man, which is another name for Jesus, he's coming again. Now, I don't know what you all think of when you hear that Jesus is coming again. Now, for some of you, maybe you look forward to that day with, with great joy and excitement and anticipation. Maybe others of you look at it with doubt or fear and, and dread. And I'll be honest with you, some of you should be afraid of that day. If you're not in Christ, if Jesus is not your Lord, then this will not be a good day for you. But for those who are in Christ, this will be the most glorious day we've ever experienced. And it's going to be followed by days of, of ever-increasing joy. See, Jesus is going to return, and when he does, he will judge all sin. Every offense that you have ever committed against God must be paid for. And if you've not trusted in Jesus as your only hope of salvation, then that judgment and that payment will fall on you. And that, that just payment for your sin is to spend eternity without God. But if you've trusted in Jesus, if you've put your faith in him as your only hope, then your sin debt has already been paid. Jesus took it on himself on the cross, and so now we can look forward to his return with, with great joy. See, Jesus is like the master from the first parable that he told, the one who switches places with the servants. 
And he serves them instead. This is what Jesus has done. He's the true king. He's the true master. And yet, he humbles himself as a servant. He says this in in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when Jesus came to earth the first time, he came as a servant. Even though he was the rightful king of kings, he humbled himself. Even though he was perfect, he took the sin of all those who trust in him and he bore it in our place. He died for it in our place. He suffered the judgment for it in our place. And so now for those who put their hope in him, we don't need to fear the fact that he's coming again because our debt's already been paid in full. And so we can eagerly wait for Jesus to come again because when he comes again, everyone who is in Jesus will be raised to eternal life. Sin will be no more. Death itself will be dead. Paul puts it this way in his first letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 26. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So when Christ took our sin to the cross in our place, he died the death that we should have died. But then he rose again. He showed that he has power over death itself. And now it says when he returns, those who are in Christ are also going to be raised to new life. And death itself is going to be destroyed. And that's really good news. But the good news, it doesn't even end there because sin and death will be no more. That means we will finally be able to experience true life as it was meant to be. Life in perfect relationship with God without the stain of sin in the way. And and all this new life will be in the new heavens and new earth, a place free of sickness and pain and heartache and death, a place of ever-increasing joy, of fully satisfying rest and peace with God. That's what those who trust in Jesus have to look forward to when he returns. And in the first parable that Jesus tells here, the master returns and the servants who have been waiting for him, they end up reclining at the table, resting. And when Jesus comes again, those who wait for him eagerly will find true and ultimate rest in him. Now, what what an incredible day that we have to look forward to. And so if we truly believe this, and that's got to change the way we live, right? And how, how could that not change how we live? And yet, how often are we so caught up in the things of this world that, that we don't really even give a thought to the reality of, of Jesus' imminent return? This is what Jesus is warning against in this passage. He he wants us to live in the reality of the fact that he's coming back. His return is going to be unexpected, and so we should stay ready. As foolish as it would be for you to say that you're moving and do absolutely nothing to actually get ready for that day, it's way more foolish to, to ignore the reality that Jesus is returning to judge the world and, and to usher in his kingdom. I mean, everything that we do should be done in light of that fact. Now, it's at this point that that Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, he chimes in with a question in verse 41 of Luke 12. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And so Peter wants to know, who who does this parable apply to? I mean, is is this just for the inner circle of disciples? Remember, there's there's a crowd here, and there's also the disciples. After all, I mean, Jesus 
talked about this, this great reward, that the master would return and serve the servants. So Peter wants to know, maybe like, who's getting this special treatment? Now, regardless of the motives of this question, Jesus, he doesn't actually answer it directly. But he responds with the third parable, starting in verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household, to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant, whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. So in this this third parable, we see again a master and servant relationship. Now the master, he's set a manager or a steward over his household while he is away. Now it's the responsibility of this servant to manage the household well. They're to make sure everyone in the household is fed and taken care of. The master has left the resources required for the servant to fulfill this, this duty. But it's the manager's job to make sure all these resources are handled correctly. And this is a picture of what Jesus has done for us. And he has given us all certain resources and the responsibility to steward them well. But to really steward them well, we need to live in the knowledge of, of Jesus' return. Because when we remember that Christ is coming back, and all that that means, it, it puts the cares of this world in their proper place. It stops us from thinking that the resources that God has given us ultimately belong to us. Now, this doesn't mean we just ignore everything in the world. We don't just sit outside on the grass all day and look in the sky and wait for Jesus to come back. But it also doesn't mean that we spend every hour of our lives hustling for the next dollar or, or living for the next vacation or, or trying to make our lives as comfortable as possible. Now, living in the light of the fact that Jesus is coming back reminds us that what we have doesn't belong to us. And we're merely managers or, or stewards of the resources God has given us. Now, this keeps us from being like that rich fool from a few weeks ago who just wanted to hoard all of his wealth. I mean, when Jesus returns, we're going to have more than we can ever imagine for all of eternity. Why would we bother hoarding wealth now for a mere 80 or 90 years at best? His imminent return reminds us that we have a loving master who cares and provides for us. One who's dealt with our deepest need, which is our need to be freed from sin. And this keeps us from being anxious about our lesser needs, like we saw in the passage from last week. This is how Jesus wants us to live, managing what he has given us well for his glory while we wait for his return. But there's a second type of manager in this parable. Let's read the rest of today's passage, starting at verse 45. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him to pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Now this is a heavy warning. Now this second servant, he doesn't live in light of the reality of his master's return. They're not ready for his return. In fact, they, they decide the master's delayed. Maybe he's not coming back. And so rather than managing what the master has given them, they live for their own pleasure. They mistreat and abuse people for their own gain. Rather than serving others with the resources that their master has put them in charge of, they use them only for their own satisfaction and happiness. They get drunk off their master's resources. They think the master is delayed. 
that, they, that he won't return, and so they're not ready for the day when he does. And when he does, they're put in their place. Verse 46 says that they are cut to pieces and put with the unfaithful. Yeah, this is a serious thing. And I, I want you to notice something here. It says that this servant will be put with the unfaithful. So what does that imply? It implies that before the master returned, this servant lived among the faithful. They lived among the master's other servants. But they were never really one of his people. I mean, that's evident in the way that they respond when the master leaves. Servants who love the master are going to eagerly wait for him to come back, but that's not the case for this servant. When his master leaves, he lives only for himself. The servant never truly loved his master. He only wanted the master's resources. He only wanted his stuff. He didn't want the master. See, it's possible to be among God's people, to read your Bible, to gather with the church, to serve the church, but to have absolutely no love for Jesus. It's possible to do all of these things for your own glory and not his, and for your own benefit and not his. I mean, you can gather with the church when it's culturally or relationally convenient for you. You can serve the church because you're trying to get into a position of authority for your own gain. And, and you can do all the cultural Christian things because you hope that somehow that's going to outweigh the sin in your life that you refuse to give up. But a servant who loves his master doesn't try to get away with as much sin as possible while his master's away. A servant that loves his master is going to strive to obey him. Now, they're not going to do it perfectly. They're going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes. But their desire is to serve their master to the best of their ability. Now, this second servant's not like that at all. He's simply trying to serve himself to the best of his ability. He's living for the here and now, even though he knew what he was supposed to do. Again, this is a heavy warning. We see in these verses that the more aware that the servant is of what is required of him, the more severe the punishment is for their disobedience. A just punishment waits for those who know the master's will but refuse to live according to it. So I have to ask, is that you this morning? Now, if it is, the good news is, is Jesus has not returned yet, and so you have time right now to run from your sin and disobedience straight to Jesus. And my prayer is that your eyes would be open to his beauty. That you'd put your hope and your trust in him. That you'd love him as the good, gracious master that he is. Because he is merciful and gracious. He is the loving master who came once to be a servant to all those who put their trust in him. To take our sin in our place. To die in our place. Not because we've earned it. Not, not because we're really good servants. Because he's a really good master. He's the one who's coming again. To put a final end to sin and death. Usher in a new creation. And so if you've put your trust in him, then look forward to his return. Be excited about his return. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And because of Jesus' work on the cross, his return is really good news for everyone who puts their hope and trust in him. Our sin has been dealt with. And so rather than living in fear of this coming judgment, we get to live in anticipation of him coming, completing his perfect work in us, and we get to look forward to living in perfect peace and ever-increasing joy with our Master. 
So are you eagerly waiting for him? Father, we thank you so much for your incredible plan of salvation. God, that you would look at sinners like us and, and have a plan to save us from ourselves. And Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your willingness to, to come to earth, to live the life that we should have lived and die the death that we should have died. And so, Father, I, I pray that, that every moment we live, that we would live in anticipation, Jesus, of your return. I pray that that would change how we live. I pray this in your name. Amen.